everyone uh, was able to join us for the last uh, two days or portions of two days. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next event, and it's a panel discussion on welding in the energy industry. Uh, so we have uh, a couple of really great folks here. Uh, I'll start off to my left, give quick introductions, and then we got a few questions. And it's really we're going to kind of leave this more to uh, a little bit of an open discussion, questions and answers, etc. Uh, and I, I have a few talking points that we'll cover uh, moving forward. But on uh, my left here, I have Patty Bird, uh, a colleague of mine here at NCCER. Patty was formerly in our uh, pro uh, product development department, and she's now in our workforce development department. So she's very intimately familiar with how we develop curriculum at NCCR in conjunction with industry subject matter experts. Uh, next to Patty, on her left is Greg Early with Miller Welding. And Greg, I believe you serve North Florida, North East Florida? Central, Central, Central Florida. Florida. Yeah, basically the Jacksonville, Orlando, Tampa, mm -hmm. Central Florida. Okay, okay, so Greg was kind enough to come on over and spend a little time and share a little bit of his insights from the aspect of a manufacturer of, of welding equipment and supplies. Uh, and then also to his left, uh, Ephraim Abrams from AWS, the American Welding Society, down in Miami. Uh, he also made the journey up. So we're going to talk a little bit about standards, certifications, and things like that. So that's really what this panel is hopefully going to share some insights on welding, how it applies to the energy industry. And really, you know, just as a quick overview, and, and maybe I can be corrected if I'm wrong, but, you know, in addition to just the average, you know, running of, uh, you know, whether it's generating facilities and things of that nature, you know, we have the construction of power plants. Uh, and there's actually a really nice article that Greg uh, shared a couple articles, uh, and there's, there's some on the back table if anyone's really interested on welding processes, uh, and there's a featured article. Uh, the one I really liked was a, uh, on a job up in New Jersey, a new power plant, and the contractor on that job was using some of the latest, greatest welding techniques and processes, and then how they worked with one of the local unions to develop that process, make sure that everyone was on board with these new processes, et cetera. So there's some good stuff for those of you who are particularly into the welding aspect of what we do. Um, in addition, we also have the maintenance of, uh, uh, of generating facilities, uh, power plants and so forth. So we have outages and there's things that are being done. So we also have to have people who have those skill sets to be able to maintain in addition to whatever the utilities themselves. So there's often contractors that are involved in this process, subcontractors, et cetera. Uh, so with that being stated, uh, the first thing that I'd like to ask the panel, if we may, and I'm going to start with Greg actually on um, this first question, but if you could just maybe elaborate a little bit further on what insights you could share from a Miller Welding uh, perspective on the construction and maintenance needs of electric and <coughs> gas utilities around the country, et cetera. So, sure, you know, sure. Well, sure. well, well, good morning, everyone. Again, as John said, my name is Greg Early. I'm the district manager for Miller Electric in Central Florida. I've been down here for about a year. Prior to that, I was uh, up, up in the Ohio and so did uh, did a lot of work with uh, with the various um, power plants and so on that along the Ohio River um, through distribution um, through the Babcock and Wilcox of the world, Foster Wheelers and all that. Um, one of the things John wanted me to kind of touch base a little bit was was, was the Kiwi project um, that we did. So um, they they basically are, are throughout the United States, but the, the primary the primary article was the one in New Jersey where um, where we. We were kind of brought in. He would, what they were trying to do is they, they had a new they had a newer uh, plant that they were uh, working on, and they were looking for new technology because what they're finding out in the marketplace today is um, really the lack of skilled welders. There's uh, it's, as most of you know who are touching the welding industry today. Um, it's a very mature marketplace right now. Um, as far as the welders that are out there. So we've got a lot of guys that are kind of wrapping up their careers, retiring, and we've got a younger group coming in. Um, that younger group, of course, does, does not have the skill sets um, as the older guys. So um, with this younger group too, a little bit more tech savvy, we'll say, maybe than some of the, some of the older guys that are, that are looking at um, you know, different, different ways. They, um, where the older guys, a lot of stick welding was done in the marketplace, not to say that that's, that's still not out there, quite a bit of stick welding, but again, with stick welding, they're looking to be a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient as far as Kiwi, and also with this younger generation. So what, they, what we did is we worked with them on some new technology, and in the article, it'll kind of state that, maybe a little later on, we'll get into what that technology is, but it's um, but, but basically, it's, it's just going from stick welding to setting up and, and doing more um, as far as a semi-automatic or wire type welding um, 
And so we have a we have a process called RMP, which is a short circuit process, and then from there, then we um, we, we go into I can fill a cap again with a with a wire. So again, kind of developing those products around those to um, to, to increase productivity, to do it quicker. That's what they're looking to do. So our, our main thing with that project was was developing those type products and then going and working with the union and getting them up to speed. So again, that they can they can do the training for um, for their their people that were going to go to the job site. Um, and with that, it was it was a real real success for us. It was a success for Hewitt, and it also was a real success for the for the uh, for the UA on that also. Thank you very much. And, and similarly, I'd like to address this next question. And it's really the same topic, but the effort, if you could just share with us a little bit from an AWS as a kind of a standard setting body, an educational uh, body for the industry. Maybe if you could just elaborate on what, what's your perspective or perceptions sure. of the needs within the construction and maintenance of, of such facilities and so forth. And maybe you could sure. share some insights. Thank you, John. And thank you, Greg. Folks, thank you all for being here. And thank you for inviting me to speak. To all the teachers out here, thank you for uh, putting up with uh, this year, and, and hope you guys have an enjoyable summer, <laughs> summer vacation here. Uh, to answer your question, John, and to kind of circle back to what Greg was saying, the skills gap is real. Uh, we all we, we all see it. Folks in industry see it. Um, you know, from the standards development side of things, uh, we obviously want folks really kind of utilizing the most recent codes and standards, really you know, building the fillings as, as, as best, best, bestly done as possible, uh, using the proper fill metals, knowing what welding symbols look like on a drawing. Um, you know, we see a real need both from a, excuse me, a skills gap perspective, but also a knowledge gap too. Uh, there's, a, there's a real need for folks to, to you know, have, those, have those credentials, have the, have the educational background, uh, have the familiarity with codes and standards that again are gonna building the buildings that we all work in, the roads that we drive on, the, the trains that we, that, we, that we take to work every day. So it, it's, it, it's real. And I would, I would say, you know, to, to, kind of, to kind of move forward on that, there are additional new processes that are out there. Uh, we all know of an additive manufacturing and 3D printing that, that, that's out now. Uh, friction stir welding constantly has new, you know, new updates and new applications, uh, new processes. There's always new fiddler metals that are coming to, 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 to light new alloys as well. So that's really, you know, some of the three biggest ones that I, I kind of put my put my finger to as far as you know new applications and new new processes that are out there. And obviously we have codes and standards that, that we are putting together to address those as well. And, and if I may just sure. add on to that. So like if I was an instructor and I wanted to find out a little bit more through AWS, sure. do you have somewhere where you can help direct people, et cetera? And I know we'll come back to that later, but sure. I'm just going to leave that as a question. Maybe we can answer it at the end of this, but I think that might be something that would be useful. Okay. So sure. I mean, keep that in mind, or okay. we'll, we'll circle back. Because that's actually be one of those resources that you can help direct. No problem. Sure. So we'll save that for that. And then, and if you don't mind, Patty, I'll ask you the same thing. You might, maybe from your perspective, in your former life here at NCCER, you know, kind of those needs, and you know quite intimately well working with subject matter experts. You know, you've been with the boiler makers and the welders and pipe fitters and so forth. So maybe you could share a little bit more about what is that, uh, those construction and maintenance needs, particularly if you have anything that you can relate to in regards to power plants and so forth. Definitely. Uh, you know, I have spent the better part of my eight years of NCCR in product development. And with that, I was primarily on the maintenance side of things. I was with boilers, the boiler makers, the mill rights, the pipe fitters, which also, all those areas are definitely construction, they're refiners, but they're also power generation. When you go into any power generation plant, you're gonna have a boiler. You gotta have a way to heat and create the energy. You gotta have ways to maintain the energy. So there is a definite skills gap, and welding is one of those areas where there's a huge, huge gap. Uh, the other problem is that there's a variety of industries that need welders, and you're all competing for the same people. So how do we get the pool bigger so that everybody has what they need and that we can get the best best students and best trainees to get into the welding industry. That's where you as teachers come in. NCCR really wants to see us, see us all work together, teachers and industry, and that's one of the things I like about this consortium, is how do we get the students from high school, middle school, and yes, I do know that they need to start in middle school. I've got, got a high schooler and a middle schooler, and especially if there's any academies, you gotta start young. Because if there's an academy program, they're pulling for the kids right in elementary school. So you gotta start early. 
We wanted to be able to build them up in high school, give them core, give them level one of welding, electrical, whatever that is. Any industry that I talk to, any construction professional that I talk to, whether it's power, construction, maritime, if someone can come and say, I've got core credential, I've got level one, great, we can work with you. And then they can continue their training and get the skills that they need. So we want to see that, that attrition so that we can kind of go from high school, post-secondary, all the way into industry. And there's a huge gap that we, as, as instructors, we as NCCR, need to help fill and make people aware of. And definitely need to show the kids what opportunities there are out there. And there are some exciting ones. They don't have to move around all the time to be a good welder. They don't, they can find a place, whether it's power, whether it's maritime, there are locations that they can kind of get a good job and they can stay put, or they can go see the country doing their welding craft, or whatever other craft that might be. But, you know, definitely, I've worked, I even worked with a substation, building substations. There's even some welding in there. So we need to make sure that we're, we're covering everything in all the different areas. John, can I just circle back? Please, to please, please, please. Robotics is a really clean component of welding, too. And welding does not necessarily have to be the dirty, you know, rusty industry that, that all of us kind of have that stereotype of. In many ways, it's not. Again, robotics is not. Added, added manufacturing is not. These are these are high-tech, high-skilled positions. You, you don't necessarily have to move around. You can. They're, they're Fortunately, many opportunities nationwide, and, and certainly here within Florida, as we've spoken of, you know, throughout throughout the day today and yesterday with the, the consortium activities, it's 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 an active field. So, so I would kind of circle back to that and say it's it has been known to have that that ill perceived stereotype, but it, in many ways, it's not. And, and, and we we as a collective body should really you know, promote that as well. Yeah, and I think just please, add please. on that too. I think the companies are realizing that too because that they. That was, as far as when you, when you did graduate from welding school, then um, a lot of people thought, okay, to make the big money or whatever, I'm going to have to do a lot of traveling. And they still do. I mean, the guys that you know are willing to travel from job site to job site um, and so on, they, they do, they make really good money. But um, a lot of the companies, too, are realizing that a lot of that work, they lose, they lose a lot of control at the job site on, those, on, on those, um, that type of work also. So a lot of them are building facilities and trying to do the majority of this work within a, a central type facility, knowing that they have to go out and they have to do this simply, but they're trying to get as much done as they can within a, a facility, which is the larger part of their welding force now versus sending 100 guys to the job site. They might send you know, 50 guys to the job site to do the assembly, and they might take the other 50 guys and keep them back at their main shop because, again, through quality controls and all that, they can, they, they can provide a, a better quality type product. So it's a changing industry. I think the, the industry is kind of realizing that you know, they have to kind of change with the, with the times too. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I think that's all part of it. I'll just make a few comments myself. A couple things I'll just share is that we, we are seeing more and more of that idea of doing modular construction. So if you go to a refinery or if you go to a power plant, they're often being, bringing in assemblies, doing the heavy lifts with cranes, et cetera and you have that controlled environment that you're speaking to. So there's jobs that are at the fab shop, uh, et cetera. So you know, that, that's, it's not moving around the country necessarily, so there's definitely some opportunities. And I'll just share just something. Uh, if we, if we kind of collectively decided we would not do PowerPoints today, and we just thought we would just kind of go uh, you know, PowerPoint free today or something. But um, you know, we have, there's one slide I would have shared, and there's a study, we, uh, NCCR works with uh, a group called the Construction Industry Institute out of the University of Texas at Austin, and it's basically a research and think tank. And we recently participated in uh, looking at some of the primary craft areas in construction and maintenance, electricians, carpenters, welders. And there was kind of a study of throughout the nation, you know, with various interviews, et cetera, you know, what are the demands, what are the lackings of these various crafts within the construction and maintenance trades? And um, when you looked at some of these maps of the U.S., some of, the, some of the regions of the country would have a surplus of electricians, but, you know, significant deficits in other regions, like in the southeast often. Uh, but when you look at the map of the welding from this CII study, the entire country is in a deficit in areas in the southeast upwards of 500% deficit of welders, of skilled welders. So just based on some of the research that's been done, we know this is a huge demand, huge need, pipe welders, combo welders, et cetera. So this is a skill set that 
Um, and, and I think one of the things we can think about, many of our students maybe go on to work in other industries besides necessarily the energy industry, but nonetheless, what we're hoping to do is to raise the quality of the overall talent pool throughout industry so that we know that those skills that we can provide and hopefully have a strong set of skills uh, moving forward. Uh, with that said, I'd like to go back to the panel that I want to talk to myself. Um, but the next thing I wanted to just uh, have uh, each of the folks share with us, and I'll start with you, Afrim, if you could, please, uh, just really the importance of industry credentials and certifications. Uh, maybe a little bit from your seat at AWS, because you guys are you know, the standards body for welding, uh, without question. Uh, but maybe you could just share with us kind of why, et cetera, and how the value of these credentials and certifications that are necessary to basically demonstrate or to prove that individuals have the skills necessary for different processes, et cetera. So you can maybe elaborate on that. Yeah, well, it's a big topic there, sure. <laughs> um, indeed, we are. The American Welding Society certainly is the certified, certified body for the welding industry. Uh, our CWI program, our Certified Welding Inspector program, is certainly second to, second to none there. Uh, we certainly have many others. We have a certified welding supervisor program, a sales rep, a radiographic interpreter, survivor body part welder. We have a whole slew of others that I'm probably blanking out on the top of my, top of my head here, here but, but certainly we have a whole slew of opportunities for, for folks to get those staffable industry recognized credentials that will give them the opportunities they need to succeed in their, in, in their welding careers. Um, we have an accredited test facility program where schools and uh, institutions nationwide can eventually begin to self-certify their own folks, folks within their employee base, within their within their, their educational arenas, within their local community. Uh, this is an opportunity for folks to get into the welding world to get, again, a staffable industry recognized credential that will in turn kind of say to a prospective employer, uh, next level of schooling, that's what the individuals are going after. Hey, I kind of know what I'm talking about here. There's a proof. <laughs> People know it's called American Wealth Society, and you know they gave us this uh, this, this, this staff industry recognized credential that that you know allows folks to to, to get those opportunities. So you know realistically, <coughs> the skills gap is real. It's big. We've uh, we've kind of talked about this a bit. Uh, I, I would certainly say that the American Wealth Society is, is is welcome to to partner with the folks around this room to you know to educate the next level of welders to to certify them uh, to get them their credentials that they need to. Pursue their respective careers. Uh, there is always a nine-year recertification process that folks are going to have to come back and brush up on those skills. And you know, talking to a room of educators here, so I would be remiss if I didn't say that education is a lifelong, lifelong process and a lifelong <laughs> learning endeavor. And in this case, welding is no different. Uh, you know, I mentioned some of those newer processes, and you know, folks kind of have to know about those to, to be successful in their in their careers. So I, I, I would I would certainly entertain. You know, questions towards the latter end of the, of the panel discussion about any, any specifics about those programs or any of the other opportunities where we can partner with folks here. But but yes, it's something that, that, that we're proud of and we want to we want to continue more so. Uh, and yeah, I'll defer it back to you there. Great, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, and next I'll, I'll direct that same question over to Patty, if you don't mind. Uh, just if you could, just the importance of industry credentials and certifications and you know, we really have kind of two different bodies here at NCCR and EWS that provide industry credentials. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit how NCCR and how you guys kind of connect with AWS standards and so forth. Uh, you know, NCCR knows AWS is the credentialing body for, a certifying body for welding. We aren't gonna compete with that. We do have curriculum. We have a very good curriculum that actually our level one and level two curriculum aligned with AWS set standards for their beginner model. So we we work together on that on those products just to make sure that we are aligning to everything that AWS has so that when they're when a student has completed those levels, we want them to be prepared to be able to take their SEMS certification. We see credentials really be, being important everywhere in the industry. There are several places, especially if you're looking at around refinery, around the Gulf area, uh, that want NCCR credentials. It means one to three dollars an hour more by having that NCCR credential. Certifications are critical, especially anything where you're doing, if you're doing any welding on a boiler, you have to be certified. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Well, thank you. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with that, and, and that is an AWS certification. But you do, it is critical because there are certain tasks that have to be done that you have to have some kind of certification on. It, it's also critical to have that credential because that's money. When you're talking to someone, and it, it's a difference between $25 an hour and $28 an hour, and then there, that doesn't include their overtime, that starts adding up in a hurry. And folks really need to have that. And, they want, and the reason the industry is asking for those credentials is they're seeing that these people are coming in safer, more productive, and more willing to learn and expand their knowledge. So that's why these are such important credentials to have. And trying to get that across to a 15-year-old, I know can be challenging. I have one in my house. Um, but it is, it's critical to the industry because we need to make sure that everyone is staying safe and being productive. And then Greg, if you wouldn't mind addressing it, particularly, I know you're not part of an accrediting body or you know, certification body, but really, you know, maybe just some insights of things that you hear and see as you run the circuit, whether it's when you were up north and oh, work in your area up there or down here, but that, that necessity and, and the value placed on credentials and certifications. Sure. I think just as both of them did it, the big, the big thing is that these manufacturers we're looking at today are, again, if you come in with certifications, it's, it's especially a, a CWI or a CWS or someone like that, again, it, 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 is, it is money. I mean, plus, they, plus the fact that um, you know, they, to, to pass these tests, I don't know if any of you have ever, uh, have ever uh, taken them or seen them or seen the curriculum or whatever. They're not easy, believe me. I, I, did, I, did, the, I did not do the CWI, I did the CWS, which, is, which was a tough deal. I mean, if you pass these, there's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, you know, I believe anyone in the industry, they, they recognize it. It's like, all right, these guys are, these guys know what they're, what they're doing to pass these tests. So, um, so again, it, it, it's, it's a big thing. I mean, these companies look at that and they think it's well respected. I want to say, you know, it's, you've got your welding engineer and then underneath that is your CWI and then your CWS in a shop or whatever. So, you know, when you, when you pass a test like that and go into a shop, or it certainly helps you. Um, it, it helps a lot as far as as far as recruitment and as far as salaries and all of that. So, yeah, it's it's it's, it's a big. And then, like you said, as far as the, the welding credentials or whatever, it's essential in, in a lot of these jobs, especially if you're dealing with power plants and all of that. So, I know a lot of. Um, I've been since down here. It seems like even more so than what I was up north, um, working with a lot of technical schools. And, Florida Techs, the Southern Techs, and all those of the world, and, I, and um, they're working real hard on, on trying to get a lot of their kids with some, with some certifications prior to going out, knowing that you know that that's going to that's going to help them as far as jobs are concerned. So yeah, it's it's, it's just a it's, it's just a very important thing as far as well. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we do have uh, one more question that we're going to get into, but I was wondering if there are there any questions at, at the moment anyone has that we maybe could address. To the panel, if you don't mind, because we'll get some of them out of the way so we don't bomb them all at the end. And I admit, I have very limited knowledge of my um, nephew to do in Louisiana, but you're talking about a deficit of, or a lack of people, but I don't know welding schools, like I don't know about high school anymore that does that kind of program. And granted, I live in Central Florida, so the only one I can think of would maybe be Orlando Tech, but nothing around where. It's, it's a lot in Florida. I tell you, it's 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 amazing. So I've just been in the, I've just been in the Florida market for a year now, but it, it's amazing the amount of welding programs and the, and the, the new welding programs. In high schools? That, um, yeah. Well, yeah. For instance, I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the board. Texas, right? Well, you've got Texas, well, but then you've got a lot of good high school programs too. I, I'm part of uh, an advisory committee in Hillsborough County, and I mean they've got you know they they've got they've, they've got programs throughout there too. But but yeah, a lot of a lot of secondary and, and stuff programs too. But um, but yeah, I'm I'm there's a lot. You know. Um, you know, I'm with Palm Beach State College, and there's a lot of the state colleges within the 28 community college system that have them, and actually we have such a robust uh, welding program that I, I apologize, we did ask our associate dean to come and speak about our program because we are so successful and we work very closely with AWS and actually and Lloyd's of London because not only do we do um, welding for the power industry but for maritime and a lot of our graduates are going to work in the shipping industry and going to um, Alabama. 
but we run our programs day and night. We have our full-time PSAB, post-secondary adult vocation, clock hour program during the day. Once they graduate with that, and then I believe they get two um, AWS accredited certificates, but then they can go after and take more advanced certificates that when they leave our program, they're actually a master welder. So, um, and there's like two or three testing facilities within the state that are AWS, and I know we just became one of them, because we received actually two Department of Labor grants for welding, and we're part of a consortium, a national um, Southeast consortium of two colleges in Florida, Polk State College and Palm Beach State College, two colleges in North Carolina, and two in Tennessee that we have this consortium that we're building the curriculum, and that cur curriculum is all free. Um, through the Department of Labor grant, and we're ending that grant next year, and we're hoping to sustain it, but there's a lot of welding programs going on in Florida. And I, I don't know about Florida, but I know uh, Louisiana, Texas, there are a lot of high schools that do do that. They partner primarily with ABC chapters, mm -hmm. and uh, so they'll do a lot of, they'll bring the kids in for an hour to each day, and they have some great <coughs> programs. That's nice. And Carol, I think there's also a lot of hidden gems that, that people just aren't aware of because I know I am the NCCER sponsor rep for all NCCER programs in Northwest Florida. So I cover all 10 counties and our service region. And I mean, just sitting here off the top of my head, I think there's nine programs in the 10 counties that I serve. Um, and, and that's just welding. That doesn't count electrical, carpentry, um, and others. I mean, there's other HVAC things like that. Some smaller programs, but there's say just real quick to your question if you're interested in that you know underwater welding etc there is in Jacksonville a school a commercial dive academy you might want to touch base with them and they may be able to share some information and insights etc so there's, yeah. there's them and there's one in Galveston and there's one up at Newport News and one in Seattle and the rest of them are just fly by night those are the only four real quality ones there is what I, what I would just add to, to that is True, I don't have those those, those numbers to say uh, as well, but I can say that life expectancy wise, I, I know a few who are a bit older than that. Yeah, <laughs> they are. Sure, they've been doing it for a while. It, 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 it's a dangerous profession, you know, on, on that side of things. Underwater, that it is, you know, a bit on the dangerous side, but it is a, a very needed uh, position. Uh, Parents, to your point about about schools, I would say because the skills gap is so real, and because folks are seeing more of the need for it, more of the high school programs are coming up. On more of that interest um, because vocational schools are, are, are getting filled up because the, the, you know, the 
night shifts are full, the, the, day, the day shifts are full. Some of these dual enrollment type programs are, are opening up as well. This is nationwide. Uh, I, I, don't have, I don't have the numbers offhand as far as how many uh, tech and vocational schools have well into <laughs> programs or, or associates programs uh, nationwide, but it, I know it's a growing number, and, and, and I don't I really don't see that changing. Every program in the panhandle that Reef is talking about is, is full of like Yeah, too. Yeah. 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 some school. 